that. Amen. Amen. Going into the word of God, if you don't mind, turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter number 5. The book of Galatians, chapter number 5. Again, we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 26 as we are sharing concerning holy living. As we are sharing concerning holy living. While you're finding Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to ask if you're able to do so to please stand for the reading of God's word. And just share with you that as you begin to dig into the word of God and be exposed to the word of God, I have found personally that those things that you are being exposed to start coming at you. When you start dealing with things in the word of God, especially when you start studying on sin and how sin operates and what sin is all about, you will find that those very th same things that you are learning about exposes itself to you, which gives you an opportunity to walk in the spirit of God and honor the word of God accordingly. I share that because for me personally, whenever I deal with things of this matter in particular, I always seem to have a rough week following. I'm just being honest with y'all. I mean, it's, it's always the devil coming after me. It's almost like he mad at me for preaching the word of God. Well, I would much rather him be mad at me all he want to and God be pleased with me for being obedient to share his word. And just know that because you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, there is a bullseye on you. And the devil is aiming at you. I'm preaching already. But you've got to understand through the word of God, whatever comes at you, no weapon. Look at your neighbor and say, no weapon. Look at your neighbor and say, no weapon. Look at your neighbor and say, no weapon. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. So you just hold on to the word of God and know that as you read it and study the word of God and those things come at you, you are never alone because God is always with you. You ought to just shout hallelujah just for that. Are we at Galatians 5? Are we at verse 22? Let's read verses 22 through 26 together. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Again, I'd like to speak from this topic, theme, or subject, what holy living looks like, part three. What holy living looks like, part three. Again, I solicit your prayers and your help in sharing this word. So if you don't mind, look to your neighbor, to your left or right, and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today what holy living looks like, part three. Just in case everybody didn't get a look on the other side, smile at them real quickly. And say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today what holy living looks like, part three. Part three. As we continue to look at what holy living looks like, we've come to the part in the text where Paul is dealing with the last three characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. If you recall, the first three, love, joy, and peace, were Godward, if you will, aspects of the Christian life, meaning they reflected on our relationship to God. Truth of the matter is you can't have love unless you have God in your life. You won't experience real joy unless you have God in your life. You won't know what peace really is until you have God in your life. The next three, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, were manward, or how we deal with and relate to one another. And the last three are what they call selfward, which means it deals with us individually as to how we 
conduct ourselves. Are we still with me this morning? The truth of the matter is, if we didn't have some kind of guideline to follow, we would lead ourselves into destruction without even realizing it. Without even realizing it. I say that because God definitely had a divine plan in showing us these nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit so that we would know how he wants us to live. He divinely put that in his word so that we would know how he wants us to live. Mm. Again, my brothers and sisters, we must all come to the conclusion that the lives we live are not our own. We were bought with a price. Blood was shed that we would have everlasting life. We had a sin debt that there was no way we could pay for it. No, nothing we could have done could have settled that debt except Christ dying on Calvary's cross. I wish I had a witness today. And because he died, was buried and rose on the third day with all power in his hand, now the debt has been paid. What does that mean? We can't live all willy-nilly. Y'all didn't hear me. We can't live all willy-nilly. Rewind. We can't live all willy-nilly. We can't live how we want to live. We've got to live the way God wants us to live. And because it's not our lives, it's God who gives us life, and, and we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is God who touches us every morning with a finger of divine love and wakes us up to see a brand new day. We've never seen this day before, but he woke us up so that we could be a part of his kingdom plan and program. And I've learned that when he wakes us up, God refills some things for us. What am I getting at? He refills mercies. Bible says he gives us new mercies every day to, to deal with that day's troubles. And he puts it in a cup for us that helps us make it through that day. And it's just like God. It's just like God to be the provider and the sustainer that only he can be to help us make it because we can't make it on our own. I wish I had a witness. Let's be real. Can we be real this morning? Some days, there are some days, some days you know, and y'all be real with me, you know you want to give up. Some days, you are at that place where all you want to do is throw in the towel. Count me out. You're through. There are even some days when you look up to heaven and say, Lord, just rapture me out of here right now. Because you know you don't want to deal with what's going to take place. But praise God for new mercies. Y'all ought to give God some praise for new mercies. You see, those new mercies help us to deal with the new troubles that come on those new days. The Bible says in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Let's, somebody say every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Think about that. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What are we saying? He is faithful to make sure the new mercies show up every day. 
If he touches us with a finger of divine love, he can take care of the new mercies for us and help us make it through that day. This is why I believe it's important, thank you, why I believe it's important for us to know what holy living looks like. Because it's a requirement and an expectation from God. If I can just pull back just a minute and put a bookmark here. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When you're on your job, there is a certain expectation as to how you are going to conduct yourself. You can't go to the job, dress any kind of way you want to. There's a certain level of respect, decency, and decorum that comes with the job. Even folks who work fast food have uniforms. So they expect you to wear the uniform, and they expect you to conduct yourselves accordingly. God has a requirement too. He expects us to dress accordingly. He said, put on the whole armor. And when you got the armor on, he expects us to live appropriately. Understanding the fruit of the spirit and to deal with people accordingly. Which means, again, we can't live any kind of way we want to. We've got to live God's way. And I've said before that we serve a conditional God. And because he's conditional, he expects us to meet his conditions. Amen, somebody. I got to go back to decorum if I can just a minute. I was looking at Facebook the other day and there's a lady uh, on the job whose boss told her that her skirt was too short. And so the next day she was required to do a presentation and she did the presentation in her underwear. He could not say the shirt, the skirt was too short then. But it goes back to, it goes back to decorum and decency. You see, we're living in a society right now where there is no holes barred. People just do whatever they want to do. They're not concerned about decency and respect. I remember a day and a time when children could not even engage in conversations with adults. If grown folk were talking and a child interceded, they were told to go sat down somewhere because that was not their conversation. They dressed appropriately. I saw something else on Facebook. I'm talking about decency, how to live holy. I saw this one picture on Facebook, one of them memes. And in the meme, there was a young man whose pants were sagging. And there was a little kid that came up, a little kid that came up to the kid who was sagging. And the the kid said, my parents taught me to pull my pants up when I was two years old. I I just want to be real with you. My parents taught me don't expose your underwear in public. So that means don't walk around with your pants hanging down to your ankles. Hello, somebody. We're talking about holy living here. And if we are going to live holy, even our our appearance has got to be holy. Now, I'm not saying, brothers, you got to wear a suit and tie every day. And I'm not saying, ladies, you got to wear a Sunday go to meet and dress every day. But I am saying that what you wear should reflect your relationship with God, how much you love him, how much you serve him, and how much you want to share him with others. God wants us to apply his conditions of holy living to our lives. And if nothing else, and if nothing else, the world needs to see what holy living looks like. And if the church won't do it, then how will they ever see it? I told my son, you can sag when you see me sagging. And that ain't gonna happen. I even told him, you can get a tattoo when you out of my house. 
Amen. That, that's my house where I pay the mortgage. I pay the electric bill. I put the food. I, that's my house. I got my own homeowner's insurance. Ain't, no, ain't nobody in here paying my mortgage but me and the Lord and my wife. So I can set my rules, meet my conditions, because I have my understanding of what holy living looks like. Now, I'm not saying if you get a tattoo, you ain't holy, but the Bible does say something about putting marks on your body, especially for the dead. I came in here without a tattoo. I'm leaving out of here without a tattoo. That's just me. That's my conviction. That's where I stand. I don't want nothing to be a distraction concerning how I'm living holy. Because the truth of the matter is, I spent 20 years in the Marine Corps, and there's a lot of guys fresh out of boot camp. The first thing they did was go get tattoos so that they can show themselves to be real Marines. I was a real Marine without a tattoo. And, and my point being, I didn't want to do something then that was going to have an impact negatively on what God had for me down the road. I don't even know if I'm going to finish this message today. We'll have a part four, five, and six if we need to because they are indeed coming. So as we previously stated, the book of Galatians was written by the hand of the apostle Paul to vindicate Paul's call by God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, concerning this book, a man by the name of Dr. Herbert Lockyer writes, and I quote, next to Romans, the epistle before us is Paul's strongest doctrinal book. In fact, Galatians takes up controversially what Romans puts systematically, unquote. He then goes on to say, Paul gives us a series of contrasts, grace in contrast to law, faith in contrast to works, liberty in contrast to license, unquote. And I have found that in every area and aspect of life, we must be able to find a balance to live according to God's design. Would you agree with me on that? So in the fifth chapter of Galatians, Paul is wrapping up his instructions regarding the fruit of the Spirit. And again, he's already shared love, joy, and peace He's already shared long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And now we have the last three characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And in looking at the, the text, he starts out with faith. Look at your neighbor and say faith. Faith. If your neighbor's asleep, wake him up and tell him faith. Faith. All this good gospel preaching, we can't sleep through it. We, we got we to gotta get into it. I wish I had a witness. This word faith comes from the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. -I -I and it means assurance. It means belief. It means to believe. It means faith. It means fidelity. Look at your neighbor and say pistis. You see, now y'all Greek speaking people in here. God bless you. It is the type of faith that allows the believer to know that he or she has everlasting life in Jesus Christ. You see, we can't have everlasting life in nothing or nobody else except through Jesus. That's the gospel message. The scripture is very clear that we can't have it unless Jesus is involved in it. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. You don't have to believe me. Read it when you get home. It says, uh, there, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Acts chapter 4, verse 12. That name is Jesus. We need Jesus. We got to understand, even in John 3, 16, when it talks about the Son, it's talking about Jesus. He's the one who brings eternal life. So as a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, we've got to have faith knowing where our eternal life comes from. Can I share with you some of my experiences? It's a sad testimony when you have Christians sharing with unbelievers things like, I'm trying to make it into heaven. If you are a Christian and you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, 
It's already a done deal. Now we've got unbelievers saying, if the Christian don't know where they're going to spend eternity, then why do I need to be a Christian? See, we've got to have the faith of knowing where we're going to spend eternity. And I'm going to tell you all right now, there's two lines in heaven. I know what line I'm going to be in. You see, you got this one line over here, right? that they call the great white throne judgment. That's the line for the unbelievers, for those who have rejected Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm standing over here only to give you an idea of where the line is. But the truth of the matter is, whoop, I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be in the line for the judgment seat of Christ. For those who have accepted him as Lord and Savior, so that he can give me rewards for the work that I've done since I've been saved. Give me crowns for the work that I did so I can take them very crowns and say, you deserve it more than me. Faith, the assurance of knowing where we are going to spend eternity. If you are a Christian, don't tell somebody you're trying to get to heaven. Tell them with the assurance, I know where I'm going to spend eternity. And it's not going to be in the lake of fire. I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and hitting planet earth. I'm going to be with Jesus. When I think about folks who make those type of statements, I'm a Christian trying to make it into heaven it really speaks to their spiritual growth or the lack thereof. Now, I need to help somebody. I, I don't think I'm going to finish this today. I, I need to help somebody here. And I thank God for what he's doing right now. There are too many people in Christendom who are faulting the church for their lack of growth. They are quick to say, I'm not being fair. As their excuse to move on somewhere else. And these very same people won't even share with the present church why they walk away. But, but let, let, let me give you the report. Th these are the same people who are not here at 8.45 a.m., for Sunday school. These are the same people who won't show up at 6 o'clock on Monday night for men's ministry. They won't come out at 6.30 on Monday night for women's ministry. They won't come out on Wednesday night for Bible study. They won't show up for revival when revival takes place. We have vacation Bible school. They won't come to that. If we have a men's conference or a women's conference, you can't find them there. Yet they are not being fed. Let's take it home. When you hungry at home and you in your bedroom and you start getting hunger pains, you get up out the bed and you go down to the kitchen where the food is so you can get something to eat. And here it is, we lay out a spiritual buffet in this place so that you can get all the spiritual nourishments that you need so that you can have the faith and assurance of knowing where you are going to spend eternity and then you say, I'm not being fed. You ain't being fed because you ain't coming to the kitchen. If you get to the kitchen, the food is waiting on you. Jesus says, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Help me, Holy Ghost. Whoop, there it is. In 1 John 5, John was laying down doctrine concerning Christ, that he is indeed the son of God. 
And while he's laying down this doctrine, he makes the statement, he that believes on Jesus, the Christ, is born of God. You see, what we deal with in faith really has nothing to what we do physically. It's really in what we believe and who we believe. As a result of that belief, now some physical things will take place. What am I trying to say? You don't work for salvation. You work because you're saved. And John breaks it down in 1 John 5, 11 and 12. He says, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Son, capitalized here in this verse, always refers to Jesus Christ. Then it goes on in verse 12 and says, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And if you have the Son of God, that means you want to share life with other people as well. Again, this faith that Paul is talking about is not just the faith we have in Christ, but the faith that is operating through us to share our faith with others. Because when you got something you like, you can't wait to tell somebody about it. Girl, I went to the mall the other day, and they had these really cute shoes. Matter of fact, hold on a second. I'm going to take a picture and send it to you. Can't wait to tell somebody. I, I think we, we, need a, we need a dose of the can't help it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We, we love Jesus so much. We're so happy with Jesus. We can't help but tell somebody about Jesus. A man by the name of Kenneth S. Woos says, and I quote, Faith is from pistis, the Greek word we talked about earlier, which does not refer here to faith exercised by the saint, but to the faithfulness and fidelity as produced in the life of the yielded Christ by the Holy Spirit, unquote. Because he's operating in us. He's working through us. Henry Blackaby said that God wants to work through us to get his work done. Problem is a lot of folks just ain't working. A lot of folks just sitting on the sidelines, waiting for somebody else to do it. They see things need to be done. They have the capability and the capacity to do it, but they won't do it because they're waiting for somebody to ask them to do it. Can I be real, y'all? I think today is a, a real pastor day. I need to be real. I don't know your strengths nor your weaknesses. I don't know your abilities nor your talents, but you do. And God wants to use those strengths, abilities, and talents for kingdom work and kingdom ministry. And if you are not utilizing them, then you are actually hurting others who need your ministry gift that God has given you. You see, we're operating in faith and allowing faith to work through us, allowing Christ to work through us. We've got gifts and we're sitting on them. We, we know we can play instruments, but we're not doing anything. We know we can sing, but we're not doing anything. We know we can stand for a few minutes and be an usher, but we want to sit down all the time. That's, that's the Medea coming out, sat down. When you know who's got you, when you know who's got you, and here I'm talking about Jesus, you don't worry about things and stuff all the time because he's operating through you. You see, you know, you know that Jesus has you and because of that, you know now you are good to go. I'm thankful that I understand that God didn't save us to sit. He saved us to go get. That's another message, but it's, it's applicable right now because you're good to go. And it's because of the faith that you're operating through you, it makes the difference in your life. All right, I'll pick on me because I can do that and get away with it. For me personally, when I, I'm operating in this faith and I thank God for it, I know where my help comes from. 
Because of this faith, I know where my hope comes from. Because of this faith, I know where my strength comes from. Because of this faith, I know where my provisions come from. Because of this faith, I know where my joy comes from. Because of this faith, I know where my peace comes from. Because of this faith, I know where my salvation comes from. Because of this faith, I know where everlasting life comes from, and it comes from Jesus the Christ. I know where my provisions come from. I know where my deliverance comes from, because that faith is operating through me. And it's there because of what he did on Calvary. We need to know what he did on Calvary. Now Paul moves on. Hopefully I won't be here too much longer. And he starts dealing with meekness in verse 23. Look at your name and say meekness. Again, it comes from a Greek word. This Greek word is prosia, P-R-A-C-S-I-A, I'm sorry, P-R-A-S-I-A, prosia. It means gentleness. It means, by implication, humility. There's a belief in our society that a meek person is a weak person. A meek person is a weak person. Jesus himself said of them in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Didn't say the strong, didn't say the powerful, it, it didn't say the ones with the S on the chest. It said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, the person operating in meekness is really operating on two levels. Number one, he or she has a humble state of mind. Y'all catch that? Humble state of mind. They are not concerned about the big eyes and the little U's, but rather they are concerned about everybody. Everybody. They operate, if you will, in peace and can fit in in all walks of life. It's interesting to me that there are some people in our society that can only fit in at one level. The, the, the only level they know to operate in. But a meek person can operate in all of these levels because a person operating in meekness can hang out with the president and with poor people. Y'all catch that? They can hang out with frats and people who fall from grace and glory. They can associate with rich people and with poor people. They can get along with the sinner and the saint. You see, there are some people kind of like, nope, I ain't going down to that homeless thing. That, that, that's beneath me. I, I'm not going to try to reach those people who uh, don't have what I have. You see, they're not operating in meekness. They're operating on their level. If you got a big house and a big car, we can hang out. If you got no house and no car, we cannot hang out. That's not operating in meekness. You see, a meek person is not about what people have. It's really about who people are. And I will share this with you, brothers and sisters, as the body of Christ, when we can get to the place where we don't see a person, but we see a soul, then we're operating in meekness. A rich man need Jesus. A poor man need Jesus. Can I go down the line? A pimp needs Jesus. A prostitute needs Jesus. A drug slinger needs Jesus. That young lady who has been pulled into sex trafficking, she needs Jesus. That drug addict needs Jesus. I wish I had a witness here today. That person who does not know Jesus needs Jesus. And if we're going to operate in meekness and holy living, it's our responsibility to share Jesus with them and watch Jesus pull them out of what they're in. Amen. 
But for some people, they're not on that level. James said in James 3 and 13, he said, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or lifestyle, which is what conversation means here, his works with meekness and wisdom. Let him show you his lifestyle through meekness and wisdom. And then secondly, the person operating in meekness has a strong state of mind. First they got a humble state of mind, now they got a strong state of mind. This person operating in meekness does not let wrong continue to run wild. Did y'all catch that? Does something when wrong takes place. Nor will they let injustices run rampant. We can fix a lot of stuff in our society if we just find ourselves in the voting booth. I'll be right back. We can make some changes in our society if we would just find ourselves in the voting booth. We won't be able to change everything, but we can participate in change. And a holy living requires us to be part of the change. We can't let injustices run rampant. Here in our society, we've got elections every two years, basically. And I'm here to tell you right now, I gave 20 years of my adult life so that people can make it to the, the voting booth every two years. I wish we would just be meek enough to go to the voting booth and make a difference. The person operating in meekness does not let it, let wrong just run wild all the time. Because you see, that person, if they see that someone is suffering, meekness steps in and does what it can to help. If evil is being done, meekness does what it takes to stop or correct it. I'm going to preach anyhow. I'm going to finish this message if it takes 2.30. If evil is running rampant and indulging itself, meekness actually strikes out in anger. However, and this is crucial for our understanding, the anger is always right at the right time. And here's what I'm getting at. Jesus is the epitome of meekness. I wish I had a witness. He cleansed a man who was suffering from leprosy because he had an issue to deal with. He cast out demons from a man who was in the synagogue one day. And Jesus turned over tables in the synagogue because they were selling unclean merchandise. And I'm here to tell you right now, it was the right time because the house needed to be cleansed. Jesus himself said in Matthew 21 and 23, he says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And some people say, Well, Jesus sinned when he got mad. No, he didn't. You know what he did? He got mad enough to turn over some tables to set some stuff straight. Bookmark. I think some parents need to start getting mad. Because they're letting children get away with way too much. And then what happens is when they grow up and now you can't, you can't control them or can't tell them anything, now everybody else got them. Now y'all don't want to hear truth, but that's truth. I'm talking to somebody just yesterday telling me about there are some certain things you can do with respect to discipline, disciplining children. Well, the final authority, which is the Bible lays it out for us. We follow the Bible, we're going to be okay. I need to say that again. We follow the Bible, we're going to be okay. As I hurry to my seat, as I hurry to my seat, the last thing that Paul talks about is temperance. In verse 23, everybody say temperance. Again, it comes from a Greek word. That Greek word is ekratia, and it means to master and control the body or the flesh with all of its lust. 
It means self-control. Did y'all hear me? The master of desire. You master desires. You master appetites and passions. Especially, I'm reading as this, this is the definition, especially sensual urges and cravings. It means to be strong and controlled and restrained. Temperance. Which basically means everything that looked good ain't good for you. Just because you want it don't mean you got to go get it. That's a Pastor Perkins definition of it. Just because you think you're big and bad enough to go after it don't mean that you need to go after it. You've got to be able to control these type of things, which is what temperance is. And when you're operating in the fruit of temperance, you have now yielded your life to the Holy Spirit and are now allowing temperance to control all aspects of your life. You see, you operate in temperance when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with unbelievers. Let me help somebody here. There are some people who are scared to tell somebody about Jesus. Scared to tell somebody. They're scared that the, the, the person on the other end, the unbeliever, is going to say, well, where's that at in the Bible? They don't know, somebody just said. Why they don't know? They don't read. They don't study. Can we rewind a little bit? They don't come to Sunday school. They don't come to men's ministry. They don't come to women's ministry. They don't come to Bible study. But expects somebody else to do the digging for them. Oh, I get to, I get to church on Sunday and the pastor going to preach. That's enough for me. Not according to Jesus. He said, give us our daily bread. He said, not Sunday bread. <laughs> I like that. I want to make sure you get your, your meal, your bread on every day that ends in Y. Y'all catch that on the way home. Every day. They're scared to share the gospel with unbelievers. If you're operating in temperance, you don't mind. I said earlier, if you got Jesus, you're excited about it, you can't wait to tell somebody about Jesus. When you operate in temperance, you control your sexual desires. When you operate in temperance, you exercise self-control over every aspect of your life. When you operate in temperance, you grow in self control. When you operate in temperance, you walk like Christ. You talk like Christ and you live like Christ. Temperance allows us to do these things because we have yielded to the Holy Spirit. Dr. Albert Barnes writes, and I quote, he says, the sense here is that the influences of the Holy Spirit on the heart makes a man moderate in all indulgences. Teach him to restrain his passions and to govern himself, to control his evil propensities, and to subdue all inordinate affection, unquote. And brothers and sisters, I think it's important for us to understand that there is, according to scripture, no law li against living according to the fruit of the Spirit. It's right here in the text. I wish you would join me there. It says, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. There is no law that says we can't operate in those things. But man and society will try to encourage and influence us from not doing so. If we want to live holy, we've got to operate holy. We've got to know what the scripture says about holy living. So if we're going to know what holy living looks like, we have to put aside trying to do things our way. I'm almost through. And begin to do things God's way. I wish I had a witness. 
with respects to spiritual living, Peter makes us aware of what's called spiritual arithmetic. You're looking at me like, where is math in the Bible? Well, you know, God doesn't just add, he multiplies. Two fish, five loaves of bread, multiplication. Isn't that arithmetic? Okay, I know I made it through high school. Concerning spiritual arithmetic, and again, I'm almost through. In 1 Peter chapter, five, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, the Bible says, and besides this, giving all diligence, here's where the arithmetic comes in. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. Y'all still with me? And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, holy living requires us to grow constantly. We should be adding to those things that God has already placed in us. We should be growing in those things. And it's a very sad testimony when you have someone who is a Christian and you ask them how long they've been walking with the Lord and they tell you they've been walking with the Lord a long time and you find out they know at that time the same thing they knew when they started walking with the Lord because they have not grown in their relationship with the Lord. Can I bring it home? All of the married folk in here. All of the married folk in here. And you've been married for as long as you've been married. Some a few weeks. Some decades. The question is, is your love for your spouse the same today? as it was when you got married. If it is, there's something wrong with your relationship. Because your love should be growing stronger, and as a matter of fact, growing deeper, so that you can withstand the fiery darts that the enemy is going to bring against your marriage. You should love your wife or your husband more now than you did when you got married. Having said that, now I'm talking spiritual arithmetic, you should have grown in your relationship with Christ more now than it was when you first said, I'm sorry, I repent, come into my life. Our daily lives should be an indicator that we grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We should know the Lord in such a way that holy living becomes the standard. It becomes automatic. Let me help somebody here. None of us are perfect. But we are striving for perfection. We will make mistakes along the way. But I'm glad God takes care of mistakes when we spend some time with him. He said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means that the Lord picks you up and he shakes you off and he said, go on now, keep living. And he's so awesome, he don't bring it up no more. I know how I said it. It wasn't good English, but no more. I'm from Louisiana. No more. Look at your name and say no more. So in order for us to know what holy living looks like, we've got to know the one who's holy. And his name is Jesus the Christ. What do we know about him? We know he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He's a friend that's sticking closer than any brother. 
He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Do y'all know who I'm talking about? He is our blessed hope and our crucified king. He's the deliverer of the sinner and the eternal father. I'm getting excited talking just about Jesus. He's the great I am and the heavenly mediator that we need with the father. He's called Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. He's the just one and the kingsman redeemer. But more than that, he's the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Many people died on a cross, but only one died for the sins of the world, and his name is Jesus the Christ. While he was hanging between two thieves, one thief said, if you are the Savior, get down and take us down. He looked at the other one and said, if you are in fact the Savior, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus looked at the man and said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. You can't make a promise like that unless you are the king of kings. You can't make a promise like that unless you are the Messiah. He said, you can't take my life, but I'll lay it down that you might have everlasting life. I got to ask this question before I sit down somewhere. Are you glad that Jesus laid down his life? Are you glad that Jesus went up to Calvary? Are you glad that Jesus hung on Calvary's cross? Are you glad that Jesus said it is finished and he gave up the ghost? Are you glad that they put my Jesus in a borrowed tomb? Because when you borrow something, you got to give it back. Are you also glad that early, 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 early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up with all power in his hands. And it's because of what Jesus did, we can know what holy living looks like. Give God some praise in the house.